So another uh, is. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Outstanding. Another beautiful morning here at the uh, the center of the aerospace testing universe. That uh, the precipitation that we had last night, you know, put a little moisture there. Uh, so as you're driving in, you can see the inversion layer, the little boundary layer. Uh, the sunrise and sunsets around here are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and uh, so, you know, with a little, little bit of help from, uh, from Gen AI and Dolly, uh, it was actually a very fitting thing, uh, thing for this morning. So uh, we'll jump into this. Uh, go ahead, next slide, please. So uh, Secretary Kendall was here in June, and from this very stage, he outlined his priorities for the department. And they are in order, China, <laughs> China and China. And what, what he's really saying, um, and if you listen to his, his more extended remarks, uh, he's not picking on the Chinese people. Uh, and he's not really even picking on the People's Republic of China. You know, the PRC is a, it's a 6,000 year old civilization, very noble civilization, very noble people. Um, it's just very, very hard to say my three or priorities for the department in order are the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party, and the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but that's what he's really saying when he's saying China, China, China. Uh, we are in a new era of great power competition. So the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and I'll say China as a shorthand for that, uh, they are uh, militarizing. Uh, we are on a path uh, to potential uh, conflict um, there is, you know, as you listen to the senior military leaders uh, across the Department of Defense, uh, it is not really a question of, of if we go to war, it's a matter of how long is it until the next war. And so you can almost look at it as we are in an, uh, in an interregnum, uh, you know, a period between wars right now, just like we were between World War I and World War II. And what are we going to do as a nation uh, to be ready for that war? Uh, so, you know, that's why Secretary Kendall stood up here, and it was very fitting that he did it here at Edwards Air Force Base, because guess what? The Air Force that we go to war with in 2027, go ahead and go to the next slide. The Air Force that we go to war with in 2027 is the Air Force that is right now flying in the skies that you are flying, that you are maintaining, that you are generating, that you are testing. That Air Force is right here, right now. <laughs> So 2027 is the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. And as we get closer to that date, uh, you know, there is uh, varying intelligence estimates on, on how likely we are to actually fight. But when President Xi came to power in 2013, he told the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, you need to be ready by 2027 to unify by armed, if necessary, uh, China. And so that's the, uh, that's the period that we're sitting in right now. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide for me. China is making a significant investment. Uh, they are building islands in the South China Sea. Uh, they have stood up an entirely new uh, arm uh, of their armed services, the, uh, the rocket. Uh, the rocket arm uh, to, uh, you know, to, you know, to send ballistic missiles and, and do an anti-axis air denial for the entire Pacific. Uh, and so that's what, we've, that's what we're faced against. Um, and they're not really trying to hide the fact either. I mean, it, I think they know that we have satellites and our satellites are probably looking uh, into the People's Republic of China. And so there is an aircraft carrier in the desert on a test range on railroad tracks so it can actually move across the desert at 15 to 20 knots. You know, that's what a carrier does. Uh, and they can practice targeting that. Uh, and guess what? It looks strangely like, like our carriers do. Um, you know, that, you know, so China's not doing this, and again, I say China. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about dignity and respect. We're not picking on the Chinese people. Uh, we, are, we are deliberately trying to avert a war that would be started by the people's, uh, by the Chinese Communist Party, by the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, hard to see right there, but this is how they see. This is a uh, this is a frame, still frame from a, uh, a a Chinese. I won't call it propaganda. This is how they see the war. Uh, this is how they see the world, um, and this is how they see their role and how they're going to project power and and do the A two A D. If you look at the war gaming, the simulations of what conflict would look like, 
anywhere from 20 to 40,000 U.S. casualties in the first week. Uh, this would be this would be devastating. Um, the best hope we have of averting that is what we're doing right here. Next slide, please. So, uh, so here's a here's a artist rendition, also with the help of a little bit of Gen AI, uh, artist rendition of what a six gen fighter. Uh, we now in the uh, 411th, uh, we have a uh, we have a flight for NGAD, uh, we have a flight for uh, CCA. Um, you know, we are we are we are testing, we are evaluating the next Air Force, the Air Force of the future that we're going to fly. Uh, take a look at that quote there. The 2018 National Defense Strategy, NDS, was a significant change in tone from everything that had come before. So for the last 20 years, post 9-11, last two decades, uh, we were focused on low intensity conflict, the global war on terror. While we were doing that, and I won't say distracted, uh, while, we were, uh, while we were executing that global war on terror, China was modernizing and investing in the future. And the 2018 NDS, very explicitly made that clear that they had moved forward and in some domains uh, they had advanced. But this quote does not actually come from the 2018 NDS. And there's of course now the 2022 NDS, which really doesn't change in tone, um, you know, that we have to be ready that we're in an era of great power competition. This quote is actually about another war. Go ahead and go to the next slide for me. This quote is from the aftermath of World War I. So despite the fact that we had invented the airplane in this country, in 1918, at the end of World War I, the Army realized that we had fallen behind technologically. Sound familiar? So we had invented the airplane. We did not fly a single US-designed fighter in World War I. We flew English designs, British designs. We flew French designs, the Sopwith Camel, the Newport. Uh, even the, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, you know, mass-produced aircraft that we built, uh, the Jenny Jan 4, was a British design. Uh, so despite the fact that we had invented the airplane. So the Army looked at that. Uh, they did a big report uh, in the aftermath, you know, after action report, they didn't call it that. But in 1918, they said, hey, you know, this aviation thing, it might be important for future conflict. Um, at that point in time, you know, I, I don't know if they really appreciated the fact that we were in, in, in an interwar period, uh, kind of like we are now, uh, but the Army invested in the future. And they said, okay, we're gonna, this aviation thing might be important. Uh, let's actually do some research and development. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So the Army went to the uh, Silicon Valley of the early 20th century, Dayton, Ohio. Um, and uh, there's a couple chuckles out there. Um, the, so, I, you know, I, I grew up uh, in Beaver Creek, Ohio, uh, one of the suburbs of Dayton, so I can, I can pick on my hometown. Um, it, it, it's, it's a little bit amusing to me to think that, that Dayton, Ohio, uh, but it was. It was the Silicon Valley. It was the hub of innovation. So when the Defense Department stood up DIU, Defense Innovation Unit, uh, earlier in the, in the 2000s, uh, mid-teens, because you know, we wanted some innovation. We're like, all right, so who, who innovates? Ah, Silicon Valley, let's go put DIU there. And initially it was called DIUX. The, uh, that's exactly what the Army did in 1918. Uh, they went to McCook Field. So this is McCook Field. Here's Dayton, Ohio. Uh, that's the uh, Miami River that comes through. That's the Mad River. Uh, if you've been to Dayton, you know the, the ball stadium's right there. That's the riverfront scape. Uh, this is now three softball fields. This was a very, very small field. Uh, but Dayton, Ohio is where all the innovation had happened. Uh, so AC Delco was there, uh, National Cash Register, NCR. Uh, Kettering, another little suburb, is actually named after Kettering, uh, the man that invented the electric starter uh, for the cars. Because before that, you know, he had a crank and he did that and people were you know, occasionally killed starting their cars because you know, the, the, the little crank wheel would start to go and it would hit them in the chest and, uh, and they would die. So, you know, Dayton, Ohio, Army goes there and establishes McCook Field. Go ahead and go to the next slide for me. So this is AFMC in the early 1920s. This was the entire Army division that was getting after aviation. And you can see all of the investments, all of the technologies that led to our victory in World War II were created and tested and developed at McCook Field. The parachute, retractable gear, 
the supercharger. You know, the fact that we we're flying at high altitude and needed oxygen masks and needed oxygen systems. All of that was, was tested, developed, and eventually they outflew. You know, you'll see this field is small, use it all. It's, it's three softball fields. Now that's all it is. When Chief and I were back in Dayton uh, last month, we actually drove by. Uh, we drove by McCook Field. There's a little plaque there that says, you know, here, here was McCook Field. Eventually it got to be too small and, and the, the Army moved uh, that aviation division uh, up the Mad River about seven, seven, eight miles uh, to where Huffman Prairie was, uh, where Wright Field was, um, which is where the Wright brothers had been testing their airplanes when they had been developing in 20 years prior to that. Uh, and that eventually became Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, uh, which is where our headquarters still is and where we still do all of the material management. And all the flight tests happened there, you know, through 1944. Finally, you know, as we were getting towards the end of World War II, they realized, hey, you know, the stuff that we're testing is getting, getting faster, getting higher. Uh, it's getting dangerous. There's a populous area. We probably shouldn't be flying, you know, all these high-risk test missions because occasionally airplanes, particularly back then, uh, we crashed a lot of airplanes as we were developing the technology because we were trying to accelerate the future. So that's when uh, the Army Air Corps uh, at the time decided, uh, Army Air Forces decided, Let's move this entire test operation out to a remote location, Edwards Air Force Base. Or it wasn't known as Edwards at the time. We didn't name it Edwards until 1949. Uh, but that moved here. And so we are doing the same thing that we did 100 years ago for the exact same reason. The other thing we did, go ahead and go to the next slide for me, is uh, in uh, 1919, uh, we stood up a little school to train Army uh, officers uh, in engineering principles in this aviation thing. The, you know, at this point in time, it's still a brand new field. And the Air Service Engineering School, uh, eventually, it's, that's what AFIT grew out of. This is actually what the test pilot school grew out of. Uh, you know, it started this, uh, the Air Service Engineering School is originally the test pilot school and, uh, and the Air Force Institute of Technology. So this is the class, Air Service Engineering School class of 1923. And take a look at those faces. and and see if you recognize one. And it's not Doc Waters. <laughs> that was an easy one, I, sorry. <laughs> the, uh, so go ahead and build for me. So back right corner there, Lieutenant Jimmy Doolittle, class of 1923, 100 years ago. That was an investment that 19 years later uh, we would realize the return on that investment in education. That's exactly what we're doing right now at the Test Pilot School. There, there is right now probably a student at the Test Pilot School. She is our next Jimmy Doolittle. She is going to be the one that when we fight the next war is going to go and go to the next slide, is going to come up with the innovative operational concept. Uh, that's a phrase from the 2018 NDS, innovative operational concepts. She's a student right now at the Test Pilot School, our next Jimmy Doolittle. And so, you know, what we are doing, what I, the reason I wanted to go through this historical context is right now what you're doing is incredibly important for our future uh, for a number of reasons. All right, next. So here's our new chief of staff. Uh, his very first memo to the force is, hey, we got to carry the torch on. So the operational imperatives uh, those came in with Secretary Kendall. He talked about them on this stage when he was here in June. Uh, the operational imperatives, uh, Secretary Kendall really issued those because he was unhappy with how quickly uh, DOD and the requirements process was, was delivering capability. And so General Alvin's message is very, very clear. And you know who's actually working on all seven operational imperatives? I'm looking out right now at, at the folks that are actually delivering that. And go ahead and build for me. And I think General Alvin may know what he's talking about. Uh, he is a graduate of our of the best test pod school in the world. In, in a, and I say that wearing a different test pod school patch. The U.S. Air Force test pod school. Next slide, please. So those are the uh, those are the OIs. Each of these are photos from things that you guys are doing. So there is not an OI. There's a, you know, there's a lot of wings across the Air Force, and, and they're very proud about their mission, and they may, they may be you know, touching on one of them. We are across the board. We, what you are doing is incredibly important for the future of our Air Force and the future of our Space Force. Uh, and it's, it's true for the Space Force. I mean, we had a satellite in the bath. 
Um, you know, we are across the domain, we are getting after this. So go ahead, next slide. Over 60 years ago, um, we delivered the future of the Air Force, right? Uh, this was the, uh, as we were rolling out the Century Series fighters, we needed a trainer, uh, a high-speed trainer, and so, you know, this is the, uh, the prototype T-38 uh, flying over our lake bed. Go ahead and build for me. And last week, yep. you know what showed up? Woo. The replacement to the T-38, the T-7 is now <laughs> The future Air Force, you guys are building it, you guys are accelerating it to the warfighter right here. Next. And there it is, on our ramp. Holy cow. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Next slide. So over 70 years ago, we also had the newest bomber and we were putting it through flight tests. That's the XB-52. Uh, this is what won the Cold War. It was the, uh, you know, there were a lot of bombers, a lot of change. Uh, after this, we, I mean, this is the one that carries us to the Cold War, and guess what? We're going to fly it for another 30 years. Uh, go ahead and build. Uh, and so, uh, you can't see the date there. The date, yeah. we could probably put 2052 <laughs> for the date. Well, we're going to be flying the B-52 for a long time. We're about to put new engines on the B-52, commercial engines, the SERP. Uh, we're putting new avionics on there. We're putting a new radar. Uh, go ahead, next slide, please. We're putting new weapons. Uh, so that is the uh, AGM-183 Arrow. Uh, that is a hypersonic missile. Uh, we, uh, you, uh, the 419th, just flew this test. Um, and uh, this is the future. Um, we are going to prevent the next war, or if we have to fight the next war, we're going to win the next war uh, with what we're doing right here and right now. Next. So, and it's across the board. Uh, these are all things that we're currently working, that you, you are currently working on. Uh, and it's really easy to get energized and to get excited about the stuff that's flying in the skies. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. But it's more than just what we're flying because a pilot without a maintainer is just a pedestrian. Mm. <laughs> yeah, man, must be up over there. <laughs> So, I mean, it takes every single function. Uh, we, we do not have enough people. Uh, we, we are going to need to grow by probably close to 2,000 people over the next three years to support all the work that we have coming down the pipe that the Air Force and the Space Force are asking us to, to do. Uh, we don't have that. Um, if, if your function was not important, we would have already cut it. Uh, and we would have you doing something else. So everything that you are doing, and so it's really, go ahead and go to the next slide for me. It is really the mixture of all the installation support, all the mission support, all the test planning, test reporting, test execution that is important, and it is uh, the 412 test wing as a team that's going to make that Air Force of 2027 a reality. Next slide, please. So our mission, we test and evaluate advanced aerospace systems. And we do it with world-class installation and mission support. You are accelerating capability to the warfighter. Tomorrow's Air Force is the one that's flying right here. Right. So we'll, we'll talk in just a minute about uh, what our priorities are. We just did a, a strategic planning offsite. We're in the process of uh, drafting our strategic roadmap. Uh, we've identified four lines of effort, um, and our very most important one, our primary effort, is going to be about our people. Uh, developing our people, developing our teams, uh, because you are the ones that do the mission. Uh, we are going to take care of the people so that you can take care of the mission, so that the Air Force of 2027 is an Air Force uh, that can win that war when we have to fight that war. Uh, while we're at it, we do not have uh, all the infrastructure that we need uh, to do that. So we are going to enhance what we have uh, and build out what we need. Uh, we also, it is unlikely that the, you know, the Air Force doesn't have 2,000 people to spare. Uh, and it turns out that the reason that the Army uh, Air Force moved that testing here in 1944 is because it was remote and isolated. Uh, that, was, that was a desirable quality, and it still is for flight tests. Remote and isolated means that you know, it comes along with some the challenges in terms of uh, just quality of life. Uh, so that is going to be a focus area. Uh, that also impacts our recruiting and, and, uh, and retention of, of folks. Uh, 
so we are going to enhance that where we can, uh, but we're, not, we're probably not going to get 2,000 people. So we are going to have to be more efficient in how we do our processes, uh, which means deploying AI, machine learning, gen AI, all the data analytics uh, to be faster, more efficient, and smarter about how we do that. So that is going to be a big line of effort. And then finally, we are going to, uh, it, we have a very important mission, and, and we are going to tell our story about that mission, uh, and, I'll, and I'll explain why in just a minute. So next slide, please. So our initial priorities, uh, we have three of them, is we are going to focus on quality of life things. Uh, this is to get after our, our recruiting, development, and retention issues. Uh, there's a number of very promising starts on here. Uh, so as you look at, you know, what is it that is, uh, you know, makes life difficult here uh, in the center of the aerospace testing universe? Just testing it out for later, making sure it's going to work. The, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's housing, right? It's, it's how far away you have to live. Uh, and to make the, you know, make the commute. I know some folks are driving 45 minutes an hour, some people more than an hour every day to get to work, one way. Uh, at least gas is only $7 a gallon. Uh, <laughs> it's actually come down. I mean, we're down now to five. It's, it's kind of funny when you listen to the news, uh, they just reported gas prices are now like on average across the country below $3 a gallon. But they always say, taking California out of the equation. You know, so, uh, so we hear that, we get that. Uh, there's a number of initiatives. Uh, we are, any day now, expect to hear from, from OSD that our 300-unit apartment complex has been approved uh, and that we can do the ribbon cutting early in the spring. So that is 300 more units on base that then opens up housing uh, for, uh, for additional family members. Um, schools, health care. Uh, we're in discussions with... Um, uh, with some, some private health care providers about bringing an, an urgent care thing on, on base. Ooh. So there's a number of things that we can do. Yep, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. It's something that Chief and I feel you know, very important. We need to take care of you because you have a very important mission to take care of. Uh, and so that's why quality of life is going to be one of our first focus areas. Uh, a couple other notes on that. Uh, California is helping us out as well. So California, uh, our, our local, one of our local congressmen, Congressman Garcia, sponsored legislation uh, so that military spouses uh, that have a certificate, professional certificate, um, can transport that uh, to any other state and have reciprocal licensing and credentialing. Uh, California was the last state that did not acknowledge that. It does now. Uh, so it is now on the books. Uh, my wife just went there uh, last week. My wife is a teacher in Colorado, uh, so when she comes here next summer, uh, she's already started the process. It's very straightforward. You go to cta.ca.gov, uh, and it's just a thing. And you upload your certificate, you upload your military orders, and, and then the bureaucracy does something, and then your new California <laughs> certificate pops out. And that's across, there's about 20 different professions, unless you're a lawyer, um, for whatever reason. The lawyers that wrote the law said that lawyers don't count. Um, but all the other ones do have the reciprocal uh, licensing and, and credentialing. Right now, uh, it's a two-year bill in the assembly. Uh, there is a proposal to exempt military retirement benefits from California taxes. That won't pass this year, but it's a two-year bill. It's on the assembly, and it's something that the California Military uh, Governor's Council uh, and the assembly uh, is very interested. Um, it, it's probably, it's not only revenue neutral for the state of California, it's actually probably a positive because there's a number of folks that retire and then decide that financially I can't stay in California for the taxes. Guess what? That is a, a, a big drain on our potential recruiting. Uh, I would love for a lot, of, a lot of folks that reach, you know, after their 20, 30, whatever it is, plus years of service, that they would stay here and continue doing the job because it's an incredibly important job. So that's going to help. So that's quality of life. Uh, the foundation of all of it, we are now in the 21st century, well, two decades into the 21st century. Uh, the thing that distinguishes the 21st century that, from everything that came before it is the ubiquity of data. Uh, and uh, who, I, 
I won't ask for a show of hands. Probably everybody has played with ChatGPT right now. Um, it is, uh, the world has changed. Uh, and AI, machine learning, Gen AI, we are going to leverage those things. We are going to use data uh, to make decisions and to be more efficient about how we do it. So we have a lot of initiatives uh, on that. Um, and uh, and you know, stand by for, for more information uh, as we go forward. The really good ideas here are coming from the execution layer. So the way that we are going to get after these priorities are something that we call commander's initiatives. And anybody can propose a commander's initiative. Uh, and it, and you, it could be at the group level, we can raise it up to the wing level. And what that will do is we'll put resources against it, we'll track it, they can be different timelines. Uh, these are different than long range strategic objectives. These might be things that take three months, it might be a year away, it might be two years away, but they're things that we want to do and we're gonna have a couple dozen. So if in your work center, if in your workplace, you have a wit idea that like, you know what? Right now, I am taking, uh, I have to take this invoice or I have to take this uh, um, logistics uh, you know, sheet and I have to type in all these invoice numbers and then I get a printout and then I get a floppy disk and then I go over to this other system and I plug it in and I type it something in again and I take something else. It sounds absurd. We have some systems that it takes four different things and then they'll talk to each other. We're gonna change that. And so if in your work center, and I see a lot of craniums going north south, like, yep, that's my work center. You are the ones that have the ideas. If you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I typing the same number in into four different systems? Bring that up and we'll figure out how do we actually move into the 21st century. Uh, this is something that AFMC has as one of their strategic priorities. They're calling it digital material management. Uh, you can also call it digital transformation and we're gonna do it because we're going we need to be more efficient about how we're doing. And then finally, we are gonna tell our story. We're gonna tell our story, first off for ourselves, uh, so that we can be proud, so that we can actually look at photos of the B-21. Uh, we can look at the B-21 flying over like, we did that. We made that happen. You know, what I am doing, you know, the defenders that we have at the gate that are keeping the B-21 safe, uh, and we'll talk about uh, a little bit later uh, during the CUI portion about the fact that we are, uh, we are a target right now for, for foreign surveillance. Um, we're gonna tell that story for our internal audience. We're also gonna tell it for our stakeholders. We have a lot of partners across the Air Force and across the Space Force that need to know that we are working hard to accelerate capability to the warfighter. We're doing it. There's another audience that I want to hear our story and I want them to hear very, very loud and clear. And that's the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I know they're looking at us um, and I hope they, they watch this video when we post it. Um, we are gonna be ready. Uh, we don't wanna fight. Uh, our goal is to have technology that's capable enough that it changes the calculus that they go through as to like, hey, we're gonna invade Taiwan next week. And then they're gonna look and like, uh, you know what? Uh, maybe not. Uh, but then if we actually do have to fight that war, then we're gonna win that war. Ooh. I want them to hear that loud. So I acknowledge the quality of life challenges. I also acknowledge that we are in an interregnum period and, and the Air Force needs us to serve right now. And that's another part about telling our story is it's gonna help with our recruiting. Uh, I'm willing to, you know, to put up with, uh, with a little bit of quality of life stuff because I know how important it is and that's the reason each of you are here serving as well. And so that's another important aspect by telling our story and by telling why we serve it will help us recruit other teammates because we need more people. We need people to come and work for us. So here's an example. Uh, we're gonna do this on a weekly basis. Uh, here's an example of why we serve. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is uh, Vanessa Gonzalez. I, I didn't check, is she here? Yeah, hey, there's Vanessa Gonzalez, all right. Take a look at this. This is why Vanessa serves. Go ahead, next slide. My name is Vanessa Gonzalez, and I am a sensor fusion engineer for the 412th Test Wing. I work at the 411th CTF. As a sensor fusion engineer, I do developmental tests and evaluation on the sensor fusion system on Raptor. Sensor fusion is the brain of the jet. It receives all the data from the sensors on the jet and puts it into one spot. It uses that information to display it to the pilot, to task sensors to do other things. So I grew up in the Antelope Valley. That basically meant that I always saw planes flying above me, above my house, above my school. 
I promised myself that I'd be a part of that. I always dreamt about working on them, never thought I'd actually do it. And then I decided to pursue my degree in aerospace engineering. 12 years later, lots of hard work, two degrees and a few moments of doubt, I served to make good on that dream I had as a little girl. I'm actually first generation American. My family came here from El Salvador, so they immigrated here. And so I just saw the opportunities that I had that they didn't and I went from there and my parents and my family always believed in me and that's the only way I made it through college. I serve because the F-22 platform tells a story of human ingenuity and determination that I am proud to be a part of. A story that inspires future generations to dream big and reach high. I serve because I believe in the importance of safeguarding our nation and providing our pilots with the best tools to defend our skies. There are 7,000 more stories like Vanessa's, uh, and we're going to tell them. Um, so, all right, next slide, please. Um, so, it went live uh, on your desktop. You will now go ahead and build. Uh, you will see a new SharePoint link. Uh, the Comm Squadron has pushed that out to your desktop, so it is now live. Uh, next slide. And uh, lots of really good information. Uh, again, we're going to move forward and so explore it, have fun. Uh, next slide. All right, so turn the page real quick on some less, uh, less things, but I've got to foot stop this. Uh, this is actually hot off the press. This was yesterday morning. Uh, this is a traffic stop. Go ahead and build for me, please. So there is a look, don't speed on base. Um, in six months, we've had over 700 citations. And that's, that's really the tip of the iceberg, right? Uh, we know this, the defenders cannot be everywhere all the time. Um, I, I, am, I am shocked when, I, when Chief and I are driving around the staff car and somebody passes me uh, in the staff car. I mean, talk about a colossal lack of situational awareness. <laughs> but this is serious, and this is a safety thing. Uh, the speed limit's there for a reason. Uh, we have young kids uh, in the neighborhoods. The speed limit is 15 miles an hour. Uh, that is plenty fast in the neighborhood. School zones, if you speed in the school zone, guess what? You're going to be suspended. Uh, your driving privileges are going to be suspended. Every single month, somebody is doing in excess of 90 miles an hour on Rosemont. There are citations over 100 miles an hour on Rosemont. Uh, it is, that is unacceptable. So please, and, I, and it's of course the folks that came here are probably not the ones that needed to hear the message, but don't speed. All right, next slide. All right, so one other uh, uh, less fortunate thing. Um, so hopefully you read uh, our message in the tower a couple weeks ago. Uh, respect and human dignity are a big deal. Uh, and this is, this is in the workforce, uh, in the workplace, how we treat each other. Um, the off-base incidents were, were very embarrassing and unsettling, and it is not who we are. Um, you know, we, we need to value each other. Uh, go back to the core values. Uh, I won't tell you the story, I'll say that for another time, about, you know, I came in the Air Force the same time that we adopted the core values. Uh, and in that period of time, we've gone through six different colors of t-shirts underneath the flight suit, uh, and four different colors of boots, uh, and three different uniforms, from BDUs to ABUs to OCPs. And, and so, I mean, if there's one constant about the Air Force, it's that we love to change things. Uh, the core values have not changed um, for as long as I've been in the service. So uh, that's a good place to go back to. Even more importantly, I ask each of you, by humans, you know, we are naturally conflict avoiders. Um, if you see something that's not right uh, in the work center, we can actually avoid a lot of future things uh, and, and EO issues and complaints just by addressing it peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. If you see something that's not right, and there's a very professional way to do it, is to speak up and say, look, you know, that's, that's not right. And you can do it in a way that's not that's not mean, um, but, but call out things that aren't right um, and, and say, hey, you know, yeah, just 
let's, let's treat other people with dignity and respect. And that's why I was very clear when we started out. We have nothing against the Chinese people. The Chinese people are, are humans like everybody else. We are all on this planet together. And a war between our nation and the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, who would drag the People's Republic of China in with it, uh, would be devastating to the planet. And we don't want that. Uh, and so respect and human dignity is, is absolutely key. And because it is so important, because the chief believes about it so much, I've asked him to say a few words. So, right. chief. Thanks, sir. Oh, hey, oh, this is on and it's echoing up here. Awesome. Hey, so, hey, hey guys, it's okay to cheer and be proud. That's part of what we do, right? So if you want to get loud, if you hear something you like, cheer. Right? That culture is very, very important to the success of our team. So the boss asked me to come up here and talk a little bit about what right looks like. So uh, I wrote down a couple note cards, which I don't normally do, right? But I think it's extremely important for me to communicate to you, is there one example of what right looks like to you? That's a question you guys can respond to that. No? What right looks like to me may not be your perspective of what right looks like. But I've been wearing our nation's cloth for nearly 26 years. 16 December will be 26 years. And I'll tell you, yeah, that's a long time. That's a long time. Um, but I don't get inspired that easily anymore because I've been through a lot. But uh, Vanessa, that story you just told right there, is why I continue to do what I do every day. So thank you for what you're doing for the United States of America and Edwards Air Force Base. How about one more round of applause for Vanessa? All right, so like I said, there's a lot of people that might have a different perspective on what right looks like. But over the last almost 26 years, there's a couple enduring truths that I wanna share with you and if you've heard me speak before, this might be a repeat, but there's a reason for that. What right looks like to me is United States Airmen acting like a United States Airman. And what do I mean by that? Act, attitude, right? Attitude is everything. I'm a, a young man that came out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I didn't have the right attitude. But it was a civilian and a senior NCO that showed me what right looked like. If you're a senior NCO at this installation, I'm gonna charge you today to go out and lead. I got your back. We need your leadership now more than ever before. Senior NCOs, I need your leadership now more than ever before. The other individual, Pat McCoy, a civilian, an airman, a civilian airman, is one of the reasons I'm standing in front of you today. So how about a round of applause for our civilian teammates that are the backbone of Edwards Air Force Base. So attitude. There's a saying that goes, it's 10% what happens to you, and what's the other 90%? How you react to it. It's your actions or inactions that will drive success in your unit. It's your attitude that that airman will remember when they go to their next installation. Let me give you a quick example of what wrong looks like. Me and my spouse, Jessica, have been here for about a month, and some of you have heard this story, so I'll leave the derogatory part out. And we're walking through the BX because that's nostalgic to me because I grew up in the military and we're walking through. And by the way, that is a good BX. I've been around this Air Force and that's a great BX. And the team over there is doing great work to ensure we have what we need here. And we're walking through there and I see a senior NCO with two young NCOs, two young NCOs. And I look at my wife, I said, that's what right looks like. So we go and we turn the corner and we're behind them and all I hear is, this place sucks. This is coming from the senior NCO. This is this, and this is that, and this is that. And my wife looks at me and she says, aren't you going to say something? I said, not today. But I went and visited that individual and had a conversation with him about why are they communicating that message, right? 
That's not the right message. That is not the right message. Your attitude matters, and what you communicate to our teammates matters. Please, please, please understand that. The boss just showed the history of our United States Air Force, where we were and where we're going. And we can't do it without each and every one of you. Attitude is important, but I need you to act like an airman. So the C is the foundation, and that's culture. What is the culture in your organization? What is the culture here on Edwards Air Force Base? And I don't believe it's what I see on Facebook. I don't. I'm going to reiterate that I've been doing this for almost 26 years. I've been deployed to the worst parts of the world 11 times, and it's not here at Edwards Air Force Base. This is the center of the future of our United States Air Force. Before I came here, I knew nothing about the test world. I didn't know what right looked like in the test world. But the front row here, and that individual over there, my wingman, and the chiefs. Can I get the chiefs to stand up real quick? I do this to them a lot. These are the individuals that make a difference in my life each and every day. That's what right looks like. The culture that a Chief Master Sergeant, and I, didn't know, I don't know if you guys know this, if you're not in maintenance, we have 13 retired Chief Master Sergeants. The number might have changed in the last month, month and a half, but I doubt it. Uh, 13 retired Chief Master Sergeants still serving here in the maintenance group. Um, and, and they're bringing a culture, and they're, they're building a culture that hopefully when the young airmen leave here, they understand what right look like. Your attitude matters. Your culture matters. Where's the, where's the weapons team at? Are they here today? Where's the weapons team at? Weapons! Alright, when I first got here, me and my wife had an opportunity, speaking of culture, to go see a load comp. If you haven't done that, please, if you get the invite, go see it. One December! Oh, that's a, that's a shameless plug for, uh, for Chief Oldcrab and his, uh, his weapons team over there in maintenance. But. Like I said, I didn't know what to expect coming into the test world, and I got invited to go to a load comp, and I had been a first sergeant out in the maintenance career field. But sometimes you forget uh, what's important, and we went down there, and that day, man, that lit my fire to watch how impressive the culture and the weapons organization is, led by Chief Aguero. So, Chief, thanks for what you're doing. If you're here today, I, I don't know, but uh, you showing these airmen in the weapons section. If you want to know what right looks like, go visit the weapons section. Thanks guys for what you're doing. That's the culture we need. Right? And since I need you to act like an airman, I need you to work together as a team. With the right attitude as a leader in the organization in which you lead, building the right culture, teamwork is inevitable. I've seen teams fail simply because the leader had the wrong attitude. Your attitude matters every day, right? And if you're sitting in here and you're like, oh my God, man, I just need to get out of here. Thanksgiving's coming. Remember one thing, you control your attitude. Attitude equals altitude. And if you're an A1C and you're sitting in here, man, I, I don't have anything to do with culture. Oh, I almost swore right there, BS. You do. I think the essence of leadership is by example. You know what right looks like. You were taught what right looks like. Do it for the right reasons. A culture is very, very, very important, right? When I think about culture, I also think about um, the United States of America and the culture that we have or don't have in this country. It's up to us to determine what it looks like here at Edwards Air Force Base. Control your AOR, build a strong culture, and morale will be a byproduct. Stop chasing morale and build culture. Stop chasing morale and build culture. Let me say that one more time. Culture is a byproduct. Morale is a byproduct of a culture, positive or negative. If I give you a day off, yay, I'm happy today. Guess where you got to go tomorrow? Back to that culture. Culture is important. And teamwork is as important. You saw the pictures the boss had up here earlier. Those planes do not get in the air without the team sitting in this auditorium right now. And China isn't deterred without 
the team in here right now. What you do does matter. Find a way to tie yourself to the mission and find a way to act like an American airman, whether you're a civilian or whether you're wearing our nation's cloth, act like an airman. And if you're a senior NCO and you're in here, go lead, I got your back, try me on it. Because words without actions are just discussions and I'm done talking. I'm gonna start acting. And I got your back. And look, I'd be remiss if I didn't take care of the, person, uh, the team that takes care of me, so I do have a shameless plug for FSS here. Education Fair is going on today at Club Rock. You didn't think I was going to do it, did you? <laughs> One of the benefits of this great nation is we get free education here. If you're, if you're, if you're a military member, go over there and get educated, because there's a lot of people that can take a lot of things from you, but they can never take your education. So, from 11 to 1600 today, go visit Club Maroc. And uh, on my last point, you want to know what right looks like, go see what Katie and the club team is doing for you each and every day. Support your club. Thank you, guys. Chief is a great partner. Thank, thank you, uh, Chief. Thanks, Chief, for those words. Next slide. This is what right looks like, too. So, uh, so hats off to all of our 150 team scores. All right, next slide, because I want the Chinese Communist Party to know that we are in flight testing of the B-21. If this doesn't get you excited to come to work for today, it is, I mean, that is gorgeous. I mean, if nothing else, I mean, the technology aside, it's just beautiful. Um, talking to one of the chase pilots, like it looked really cool. Um, so that's what we're doing. That's what you guys are doing. All right, so we started five minutes late, which means we have about 10 minutes for questions. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, there's the, uh, the text number, and I think we're gonna get the, uh, our very capable uh, team off. We also have microphones if, you, uh, if you're not bashful and you wanna ask the question uh, in place, in person. All right, so it's 412-707-412-707-1. Uh, TWCC, Tango Whiskey, Charlie Charlie, Test Wing CC. All right, here's a question. System sustainment is a real challenge for unique test capabilities we bring on board to support customers. Is there any proposals in the work to keep critical capabilities without them diverging? divesting in them for sake of obsolescence? Yeah, so that's a great question, huge question, uh, and something that the Air Force is actually wrestling with. Um, we are modernizing every single weapon system in the Air Force, uh, from radios and computers to all of our nuclear weapons. And we're doing it all at the same time. Um, you know, we are working on the newest bomber, the B-21, at the same time that we're working on the oldest bomber, the B-52. Uh, and so there's a trade-off that the Air Force faces, you know, there's only so many, uh, only so much money. And so how do you, you know, what do you invest in recapitalization and what do you invest in sustainment? Uh, and so uh, these are questions that, you know, at the very highest level uh, that our, you know, our four stars are, are wrestling with. You know, how long do we keep the B-1? You know, we are going to be a two bomber Air Force. It's going to be the B-21 and the B-52. When do we phase out the B-2? We are still doing B-2 testing today. Uh, and when we phase out the B-2 is going to depend on, you know, on what the 420th finds out about the B-21 and how ready the B-21 is. And so those are questions that are actually going to be answered by you, by the data that you're doing. So uh, I don't have an easy answer that we're going to you know, keep the B-1 flying for this long, uh, and we're going to put the sustainment money there because we need those dollars to go elsewhere. But guess what? You saw B-1 up there because we are still doing stuff on the B-21. B-21 is a, or B-1 is a stopgap until B-21 comes online. So uh, it, is a, it is a very, very complicated juggling thing. Um, that's all I'll say about that. Oh. <laughs> 
Okay. The, uh, next question is... The hard ones, Chief's going to get all the hard ones. <laughs> the next question is, is it required for us to stop during Reveille slash the National Anthem, and why? I don't need to phone a friend on this one. Don't mind All right. Yes, on a military installation, it is required that you stop and pay respect during Reveille and during retreat, and absolutely during the song that we all agreed to defend. Whoa. I don't know why, that's almost emotional to me. <clears throat> A lot of my friends have, have given their life for that music. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So the answer was yes, in case I don't get back to it. And why, here's why. For all the men and women that have given their life for, for our country, that's why. Somebody's brother, somebody's sister, somebody's mother, somebody's father. To give two minutes of your time to stop your car, put your four-way blinkers on. See how I'm doing this? That's what you do during this. Right? And sit there and give a moment for those people who gave their life. That's why I stop. I guess you've got to find a reason to want to. And that's my reason. Is it mandatory? Yes, but there's a lot of mandatory things on this base, like the speed limit. <laughs> See how I wrap that back, boss? I'm just saying, I'm getting good at this stuff, okay? <laughs> but it's even better when you find a reason to, find your why, and stop, and take a second to think about all those individuals, right? It's hard for younger people to understand that, that haven't been through what a lot of us seasoned, won't call them old, Doc, not that they're old. <laughs> seasoned individuals have been through, but the short answer is yes, the long answer is find your why, and it's easy to stop, and it's easy to pay respect. That's why. All right, so we got three minutes left. Yeah, great answer, great answer. We got three minutes left, so we got about two or three maybe questions. We will answer all the questions uh, through the tower. Uh, so anything that you texted in or sent in, we will certainly get to and we'll get an answer to, but uh, if we have some hot burning ones that need to be addressed in this venue, or if there's any in the audience as well. There's one back here. Go ahead, audience. <coughs> Colonel Wicker. Good morning. Morning. My question is, well, first of all, my name is Ted Reynolds. I'm with the HVAC department. Oh. So, <laughs> all right, all right. My question for you, sir, is uh, when, if all, we are going to be included, and I mean the all the CE, going to be included in the pay raise that was also uh, given to the uh, maintenance group yeah. this year? Okay, okay, question. Yep, great question. Uh, great question. Uh, I, I don't have an immediate answer. We will get an answer. Uh, it is one of the things, uh, as we are looking under our strategic line of efforts, uh, the recruit, develop, retain uh, objective is are we using all of the authorities that we have, all of the incentives that we have uh, for recruiting and pay, incentive pay, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we will get into that and, uh, and we will definitely get an answer back, uh, back through uh, Colonel Purcell. Good question. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Paul. Um, Another one in the audience, or I think we have time for one more, because we've got to, I, I want to get to the awards, because this is uh, also really a lot of fun. Here's a question, sir. Is there a proposal for a fence gate surrounding the entirety of Edwards Air Force Base to deter the enemy? A fence? Yes, sir. Fence or a gate? Fence or a gate. Uh, so there are uh, over, uh, I'm going to, uh, it's over 100 miles of perimeter. Um, that's a lot of fence. Um, the, we do have other means, um, you know, so fences can be climbed, uh, they can be underneath, so it's not necessarily clear that a, a fence would, would, would deter everything. Um, one of the reasons that we like being remote and isolated is, is, you know, across 500 square miles of desert. Um, we got rattlesnakes, Mojave greens, um, <laughs> That's our gate. the, um, the, we do have other means, though, of actually without an actual physical barrier of knowing when people are coming. And, and I'll leave it at that. Our defenders are extremely capable uh, of knowing what's out there. 
Um, so, you know, where we need fences, we'll have fences. And, and where we'll use other technologies and other means, we're going to use other technology and other means to protect uh, what we have here. All right, so I, I do want us to get into the award ceremony. Uh, I want to thank, uh, Chief, I want to thank each and every one of you for what you do for us. It is, it is and, and I mean this genuinely, as sincerely, it is incredibly important. Um, I have a daughter that's about to commission the Air Force. Uh, if she ends up going yeah. over, Yeah, I mean, so this is personal. Uh, if we end up in a war, with a war uh, I want us to have the best damn Air Force that we have so that, uh, first off, we don't have to fight that war. But second, if we do, we're going to win it. So, All right. Right. Thank you. I'm Staff Sergeant Antonio Ramirez from the 412th Maintenance Group. And I'm what? Staff Sergeant Brandon Whiteley from the 412th Maintenance Group, and we will be your MCs for today's events. All right. Yeah. It is now time to recognize the 412th Test Wing Third Quarter Award nominees and winners. Nominees, please stand when your names are displayed. Audience, please feel free to make some noise and show support. Winners will also get a chance to throw an axe at the inflatable turkey to my left. <laughs> Starting with the team category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Civil Engineer Group, Operations, Engineering, Requirements, and Optimization. Woo! Yeah. From the 412th Electronic Warfare Group, JSE Software Development Team. From the 412th Medical Group, Dental Flight. We call it that From the 412th Mission Support Group, High Desert Inn Lodging Team.
In the testing category, the nominees are as follows. From the 411th Flight Test Squadron, F-22 Raptor Release 3 Testing. From the 416th Flight Test Squadron, Agility Prime Testing. From the 412th Electronic Warfare Group, Project Havoc. From the 412th Maintenance Group, FTX 26. From the 412th Operations Group, Global Reach C-17 Air Launch Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile Team. From the 412 Test Engineering Group, F-22 Release 3 Test. From the United States Test Pilot School, Have Viper GPT. And the winner is from the United States Test Pilot School yeah. at Viper GPT. Now on to the civilian categories. First up in the supervision management category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Civil Engineer Group, Adam Burgess. From the 412th Electronic Warfare Group, Daniel, Daniel O'Connell. From the 412th Mission Support Group, Allison Skiles. From the 412th Operations Group, Katherine Allen. From the Operating Location, United States Air Force Plant 42, Nestor Rodriguez. From the 412th Test Engineering Group, Cassie Wellborn. From the Test Management Group, Josefina Gonzalez. From the 412th Test Wing Agencies, Christina Urquizuto. And the winner is, from the 412th Maintenance Group, Bryce Swalson. In the scientific engineering category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Civil Engineer Group, Gary Provokovich. From the 412th Electronic Warfare Group, Vanessa Gonzalez. From the 412th Test Engineering Group, Brianna Mayer.
from the United States Test Pilot School, Aaron Wenner. From the 412 Test Week Agencies, Ivan Chang. And the winner is from the 412 Test Engineering Group, Brianna Mayer. In the scientific, er, excuse me, in the specialist and analysis category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412 Civil Engineering Group, Imelda Bontalan. <laughs> From the 412 Maintenance Group, Stefan Nelms. From the 412 Operations Group, Stephanie Gray. From the 412 Test Engineering Group, Sandra Elena Castrejo. From the 412 Test Management Group, Shavana Farr. From the United States Ti Test Pilot School, Raul Ichari. From the 412 Test Wing Agencies, Gerano Serrano. From the and the winner is from the 412 Maintenance Group, Stefan Nellis. In the Program Project Manager category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412 Civil Engineer Group, Jeff Lynch. From the 412 Electronic Warfare Group, Jane Morris. From the 412 Medical Group, Eugene McQuellen. From the 412th Operations Group, Brett Smith. From the Operating Location, United States Air Force Plant 42, Stephen Nassily. From the 412th Test Engineering Group, Alan Hagopian. From the 412th Test Management Group, Brittany Romer. From the United States Test Pilot School, Megan Cochran. From the 412 Testing Agencies, Melvin Hoya.
And the winner is from the 412th Operations Group, Brett Smith. In the staff technician category, the nominees are as follows. Come on. From the 412th Civil Engineer Group, Jeff Craig. <laughs> From the 412th Electronic Warfare Group, Raylene Locker Prothro. <laughs> From the 412th Medical Group, Margaret Kaiser. From the 412th Mission Support Group, go. Megan Avila. Yeah. From the 412th Operations Group, Zachary Kofal. From the Operating Location, United States Air Force Plant 42, Miguel Davis. From the 412th Test Engineering Group, Dante Cummings. From the 412th Test Management Group, Sharon Dawson. From the United States Test Pilot School, Brian Sanchez. From the 412th Wing Agencies, Jamal Hammond. And the winner is, from the 412th Operations Group, Zachary Kofal. In the Trays Flavors category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412 Civil Engineer Group, Brandon Clifton. From the 412 Mission Support Group, Graham Brown. Maintenance Group, Aaron Moore. From the operating location, the United States Air Force Plant 42, Eric Weatherford. And the winner is, from the 412 Maintenance Group, Aaron Moore.
In the Administrator Commander Support Staff category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Civil Engineering Group, Emily Ann Johnson. From the 412th Electronic Warfare Group, Sarah Decor. From the 412th Mission Support Group, Cody Vernon. From the 412th Operations Group, Elizabeth Browning. From the Operating Location, United States Air Force Plant 42, Jesus Rentrilla. From the 412th Test Engineering Group, Jamie Lee Beck. From the 412th Test Wing Agencies, Julie Triggs. And the winner is, from the 412th Maintenance Group, Marco Squirtle. Congratulations to all the winners and nominees in the civilian categories. It is now time for the military portion of the awards. In the field grade officer category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Medical Group, Major Don Rollins. The 412th Operations Group, Major Rachel Williams. From the United States Test Pilot School, Major Stephanie Coward. From the 412 Testing Agencies, Major John Morales. And the winner is, from the 412th Operations Group, Major Rachel Williams. Company grade officer category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Medical Group, Captain Emily Doe. From the 
412th Mission Support Group, Captain Andrew Metz. <laughs> From the 412th Test Wing Agencies, Captain Michael Love. From the 412th Maintenance Group, First Lieutenant Michael Shin. Thomas Murphy. From the 412th Test Engineering Group, 2nd Lieutenant Carlos Easterbrook. And the winner is from the 412th Mission Support Group. Just for the record, uh, the the cop just got a bullseye. In the senior non-commissioned officer category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412 Civil Engineering Group, Master Sergeant Calvin Moore. From the 412 Medical Group, Master Sergeant April Gregory. From the 412th Mission Support Group, Master Sergeant Lincoln From the 412th Maintenance Group, Master Sergeant Kelvin Castillo. From the 412th Operations Group, Master Sergeant Matthew Giles. From the 412 Testing Agency's Master Sergeant Larissa Hansen. And the winner is from the 412 Operations Group, Master Sergeant Matthew Guy. In the non-commissioned officer category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Maintenance Group, Technical Sergeant Jose Ariano. From the United States Test Pilot School, Technical Sergeant Joseph Fromm. From the 412th Test Wing Agencies, Technical Sergeant Taylor Heydrich. From the 412th Civil Engineer Group, Staff Sergeant Larry McIver.
from the 412th Medical Group, Staff Sergeant Nelson Towns. From the 412th Mission Support Group, Staff Sergeant Brett From the 412th Operations Group, Staff Sergeant Renato Avalos. From the Operating Location, United States Air Force Plant 42, Staff Sergeant Carlos Mendez. And the winner is from the 412th Mission Support Group, yeah! Staff Sergeant Brett In the Airman category, the nominees were as follows. From the 412 Civil Engineer Group, Senior Airman Thomas Moriarty. From the 412 Medical Group, Senior Airman Jonathan Edling. The 412th Mission Support Group, Senior Airman Jasmine Gary. From the 412th Maintenance Group, Senior Airman Stephanie Lopez. From the 412th Operations Group, Senior Airman Jeremy Haddon. Operating location, United States Air Force Plant 42, Senior Airman Eduardo Hernandez. From the United States Test Pilot School, Senior Airman Aaron Schofield. From the 412 Testing Agencies, Airman Gracie Pillar. Mission Support Group, Senior Airman Jasmine Gary. In the Honor Guard category, the nominee and winner is from the 412th Maintenance Group, Senior Airman Matthew Childs.
Now it's time for the special categories. Nominated for the innovation category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Civil Engineer Group, Comprehensive Industrial Oil Analysis and Diagnostics Testing Team. From the 412th Electronic Warfare Group, Maria Elena Cisneros. the 412 Medical Group, Marjorie Quintanilla Ramos. From the 412 Maintenance Group, Nicholas Browning. From the 412 Operations Group, V2, our ALT team. From the 412th Test Engineering Group, Jordan Connor. And the winner is from the 412th Test Engineering Group, Jordan Connor. Nominated for self safety well done of the quarter, the nominees are as follows. From the 412 Civil Engineer Group, Jasmine Castillo. From the 412 Electronic Warfare Group, Matthew Fares. From the 412 Maintenance Group, Crashed, damaged, disabled aircraft <laughs> From the 412 Operations Group, Guillermo Ortiz. From the 412 Test Engineering Group, Rylan Stanfeld. From the United States Test Pilot School, Nathan Sheehy. And the winner is from the 412 Test Engineering Group, Brian Lindsay. But wait, the leadership was so impressed by the nominations that we have a second winner. And the second winner is from the 412th Operations Group, Guillermo Ortiz.
in the For the Warfighter category, the nominees are as follows. From the 412 Civil Engineer Group, Corwin Bird. From the 412 Electronic Warfare Group, Leticia Pandoja. From the 412 Mission Support Group, Victor Medina Oranavas. From the 412 Maintenance Group, Luke Staley. From the 412 Operations Group, Alexander Hutchison. From the Operating Location, United States Air Force Plant 42, Kenneth Ortiz Padilla. From the 412 Test Engineering Group, Anthony Parsec. From the 412 Test Wing Agencies, Bertrand Shepard. And the winner is from the 412 Civil Engineer Group, Corwin Bird. But in another twist, leadership was so impressed again by the nominations that we have a second winner. And the winner is from the 412 Electronic Warfare Group, the DCI. Nominated for Volunteer of the Quarter, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Electronic Warfare Group, Karina McClelland. From the 412th Medical Group, Staff Sergeant Michael Marino. From the 412th Maintenance Group, Technical Sergeant Brittany Mesterka. From the 412th Maintenance Group, Technical Ser Sergeant, oh, excuse me. From the 412th Operations Group, Technical Sergeant Isaiah Siegler. From the 412th Test Engineering Group, Child Development Center Volunteer Team. From the United States Test Pilot School, Lieutenant Colonel Carlos Pineda. And the winner is from the 412th Maintenance Group Technical Sergeant Brittany Mister.
For the spouse of the corner, the nominees are as follows. From the 412th Operations Group, Quincy Boswell. From the 412th Test Engineering Group, Holly Sick. From the United States Test Pilot School, Nicole Cato Stevens. The winner is from the 412th Operations Group, Quincy Boswell. Except on their behalf of the Senate Colonel Pat Christine. In the added court category of Dorm of the Quarter, the nominee and winner is from the 412th Maintenance Group, Airman First Class. <laughs> And as always, our last award is for the group with the most spirit. So let's go around the room and see who got the most. Hey, so real quick, man, let me uh, update you guys on this. So before, if you won the spirit award, right, you had to set up the next award ceremony. But guess what? That's not the case anymore because that's not how we're doing it here. Because we want to hear all your spirit, right? We're going to get a schedule together. Everybody's going to share a little bit of the love. But I want to hear some spirit. So if you didn't show us your spirit before because you didn't want to set up an award ceremony, Woo! now's your chance to bring the heat. So let's go. Woo! Right, let's go. Let's go. deliberation. <laughs> Let's go MSG, come on up here, get your award. Uh, what about the CDC people up here? What about the CDC team up here? Let's go. Come on, CDC team.
Thank you, Colonel Wicker and Chief Stoltzfus. Would either of you like to provide some closing remarks? I will, thank you. So, look at that, right on time. That's on time, on target. Whoa! The, uh, so, it is, uh, it's actually a lot of fun to read through all the award packages. Uh, it is incredibly hard to pick, uh, which is a good thing, uh, because the award packages are all about the war winning capability. Uh, I am just really, really happy that when we go to war, we're going to be going to war with the B-21, with NGAD, CCAs, and not with Nerf axes, because uh, <laughs> that's not going to work in the Pacific. Um, but what you guys are doing every day is going to, so time to go out there and do, do it some more. Thank you. I really appreciate each and every one of you for being here today. Thank you for taking time to show your support for our outstanding performers. This concludes our ceremony. Please stand for the departure of the official party.